Well, good morning. Welcome to Hickson First Baptist Sunday School lesson this morning, uh, October the 10th, 2021. Beautiful day. It's always a beautiful day. Rain or shine, hot or cold, it's the Lord's day. It's a beautiful day. Today I want to talk to you about your sureness of salvation. If you have confessed Jesus Christ to be saved, to be your Savior, can you be sure you are going to heaven? The answer to that is a resounding yes. You don't have to be worried about it, thinking about it all the time. You are sure of your salvation. You can afford to be wrong about going to Disney World, <clears throat> but you cannot be wrong about going to heaven. <clears throat> New believers a lot of times will struggle with the certainty of their salvation. And even with older believers, so Satan can show seeds of doubt in anyone. No one is accepted from this. He'll work on you. He'll try to convince you you're not saved. <clears throat> there are four truths <clears throat> about salvation. God cannot lie is number one. Your assurance is based on the absolute truthfulness of Scripture. It's not called God's Word for any other reason other than it's God's Word and He doesn't lie. Consider Romans 10, 13. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's cut and dry. This is a promise. If you have committed your life to Jesus Christ, you can have the firm confidence of salvation based on the truthfulness of God's Word. In John chapter 6, verse 37, Jesus said, The one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. If you come to Jesus with genuine repentance and faith, He promises that He will save you. When the Bible speaks, God speaks. What God said, he will surely do. He will save all who call upon Jesus Christ. You have his word on it. There's a second truth about the sureness of your salvation. And that is, Jesus paid it all. Assurance rests on the finished work of Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, he bore our sins. He endured God's wrath. And what I mean there is he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then the last thing it said, it is finished. What was finished? Well, in John 19.30, John tells us he had atoned for all of our sins, past, present, future. Our entire sin debt is paid in full. Trusting in Christ's perfect sacrifice for our sins, the certainty of eternal life floods our hearts no matter how great your sin is, God's grace is greater. There's a song I really love. There was a, a preacher in Macon, Georgia, at Mabel White Baptist Church that opened his television program every week with grace, grace, God's grace. Uh, I love that song. In the Old Testament, in Isaiah 1.18, it says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, 
they shall be whiter than snow, though they are red as crimson. They shall be like wool. The wool of a sheep is white. So Jesus Christ is the answer. And the price he paid up on the cross for you and I to be saved. The third truth is that there is a great convincer of our assurance. And that comes through the inward witness of the Holy Spirit. When you are saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live within you. He guides you. He reassures you of your salvation. It's the inward witness of the Holy Spirit. Where does the Holy Spirit come from? God gives the Holy Spirit to us. And he bestows assurance to all true believers. It is the Holy Spirit's ministry to convince our hearts of our salvation. Other people cannot give us this assurance. We cannot work our way into this assurance by ourselves. Only the Holy Spirit working within us can give us the absolute certainty of our eternal salvation. You need to make sure if you are saved that the Holy Spirit indwells you. If you feel like that the Holy Spirit does not indwell you, you need to do some recent checking, reasonable checking about your salvation experience. Because if you are saved, the Holy Spirit is there. 1 John 3.24 We know by this that he abides in us by the Spirit which he has given us. That Spirit he has given us is the Holy Spirit. That was in 1 John 3.24 1 John 4.13 reads, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us the Holy Spirit. We know that we abide in him and he abides in us because of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.16 reads, The Holy Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Remember that again, Romans 8, 16. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. There's the assurance. We are children of God. The Holy Spirit working in us convinces us that we belong to Christ. It is the Holy Spirit's inward witness that persuades us of our genuineness of our salvation. I was saved as a teenager. That was this very persuasive preacher, preaching a revival at Second Street Baptist Church in Macon, Georgia. A lot of teenagers committed themselves during that revival. I said he was a very persuasive preacher. I'll be honest with you. I, I, I knew what I was doing, but I didn't know what I should be doing after that. That's the part he left out, I think. Didn't live for Christ for many years. Sinned a lot. Uh, when I prayed to God, I don't think I was praying for forgiveness. I think I was praying that I wouldn't have to pay the penalty for the sin I'd just committed. There is a distinct difference in the two. 
you either pray for forgiveness or you're praying for you won't have to pay the penalty for the sin. Number four, the fourth truth. You should have a new life in Christ. There is evidence of a changed life. You go from what you were doing into something new. The old things you did, you don't do anymore. And the reason you don't do it anymore is that the Holy Spirit will convict you of that sin. And you can't live with that conviction. You have to ask God for forgiveness or you will be one more miserable individual. Holy Spirit convicts. Pray to God for forgiveness. He forgives us and it's done with. The best example I can give you of that is David, King David of the uh, Israelites. King David at time committed some of the most awful sins you can think of. Maybe some things you and I wouldn't do. He was adulterous. He was uh, a murderer. He was a conniver. Uh, but David had a knack or a conviction that when he sinned, he repented. And back in those days, they would heap ashes on their head and wear sackcloth as a symbol of their repentance. We have to remember that we will never be perfect in this life. But if we're saved, there should be evidence of change from the time before until the time after we were saved. Sin is going to be part of our life. So therefore, forgiveness and repentance has to be a part of our life. Those two things will continue to give you assurance of your salvation. The book of 1 John details the vital signs of our new life in Christ. <clears throat> in 1 John 2, 3, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. In other words, we will have a willing obedience to God's word. 1 John 2, 9, 11, 9 through 11, deals with love for other people. If you're genuinely saved, you have a love for others. John 2, 12 through 14, deals with love for God. John 2, 15 through 17, deals with understanding biblical truth. I dealt with that in a lesson recently where we talked about the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and one of the things I said was, if you were having trouble understanding the Bible, get the Holy Spirit to explain it to you. He'll help you understand what you're reading. 1 John 2, 20 through 27 deals with righteous behavior. How should you be acting as a Christian? What is your behavior? Good, bad, otherwise. 1 John 3, 4 through 6 deals with opposition from the world. The world is going to not believe you. The world doesn't understand you if you're a Christian. They do not know your assurance. They don't have your assurance because they've never accepted. So there's opposition. They will laugh at you. They will make fun of you. I remember <clears throat> I worked as a manager of a trucking company for years. 
there was an older man that was a driver for us. And every day at lunchtime, I noticed that man with his lunch, with a Bible, opened up on the lunch table. And while he ate lunch, he read the Bible. He read the Word of God. I listened to the words of the other drivers who were not saved and did not understand what the man was doing. So I knew he was getting opposition, he was getting made fun of, uh, he was being called a saint, uh, other things. But there's opposition from the world. First John 3.13 deals with answered prayer. If you're saved and you see your prayers answered, then you can be assured of your salvation. 1 John 3, 22 through 24. As we see this spiritual fruit produced in our lives, we may be confident that Christ lives within us. If you are saved and Christ lives within you, you will begin to see the fruit of that being produced. You will see things begin to happen you will see things begin to, you will begin to understand more. Uh, the fruit that's produced will give you confidence. The assurance of salvation boils down to this. It's God's blessed gift for all who believe. If you believe, you have that assurance. And last but not least, <clears throat> 1 John 5, 13. John says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may have eternal life. That sums it up. You believe it. You believe the Word of God. You believe in the name of the Son of God. You believe that he saved your soul. You believe that you're going to heaven. You have that assurance that you're going to have eternal life with Jesus in heaven when you die. Thank you for being with us this morning. We will see you next time.